I'm going to talk to y'all this morning about Philippians 2, 1 through 15, and I might get through two verses, because it is so rich, and you hear me say that, but it's the truth. You can just talk and talk about one word. Can't right there, as Charles used to say. But I want to say good morning to the Zoomers and bienvenidos. We love y'all, and y'all come on in here when you get an opportunity. So if you're looking at verse one, well, before we start, excuse me. The title of the lesson this week is Joy Through Humility. We talked a little bit last week about joy. We talk about humility all the time. I know y'all are sick of hearing me talk about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a Sunday school lesson, so you got to be it. God bless you. Uh, now, I want to ask you a question. Tell me this morning as we begin, what does humility look like to you? And think about, take it a step further, what does joy through humility look like to you? I had to really think about that because I never really put the two together so much. Go ahead, Don. Well, I think the most humble thing I've heard about is Jesus Christ. Why in the world would the Lord of Lords King of Kings watch those men? Oh, yes. The Lord, the Master of the Universe, the Lord of our creation. Isn't that incredible humility? That shows it. We have time. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So thank you for that. Anything else? Joy through humility. Mickey. With the verse, don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Don't know where it is in this good book, but it's a good, good verse. <laughs> Sooner or somewhere, I'll read it too. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Romans 12. Romans 12. Thank, Thank you. you. Carl, are you sneezing or you got something to say? Sneezing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get it out. <laughs> Verse 1 says So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, and sympathy. It goes on to verse two. We're going to come back to verse one. Paul begins verse two by saying, complete my joy. Now, of course, that's an admonition to, to them, but is I will tell you, as I look at the Sunday school lesson, I'll do a quick read through the book, see what the book says, and then I will look at the scripture, and I'll do my own survey, and, and I will pick out what appeals to me. I will do it in prayer, so it's not just, mm, you know, I feel good about this, I'm going to do it. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will always guide me as I'm looking for points in a particular scripture. So what I do try to do as far as the lesson is stay with the scripture. I don't always stay with the actual theme. And this week, the theme is joy to the know or kind of something like that. And I wasn't all that impressed with that. I was going through and doing other stuff. Well, this morning, I woke up at 4.30. I don't normally wake up at 4.30. And what's on my mind? some scripture about joy. So I took that as a uh, check from the Holy Spirit to talk to y'all a, a little bit more about joy. Now, if you look at Hebrew 12, 2, which is scripture came to mind, one of a couple, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Y'all know that scripture. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of those, excuse me, at the right hand of the throne of God. If you go on and you look at Nehemiah 8.10 or go back and look at Nehemiah 8.10, what does it say about joy? It says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And a lot of times folks will read that and they will interpret that as God's joy is going to give me strength. And it may well do that. But what the scripture is saying is that the joy that you have that comes from God that can only come from God that we've talked about a number of times is there will be that thing that gives you strength. So what is joy? Now, I know that y'all know that it's a, a pleasure, a goodness, a wonderful feeling, a happiness that God gives that the world can't take away. I know y'all know that. But beyond that, what would you say joy is? That's not a hard question, but it is a hard question, isn't it? Yes, it is. Go ahead, Rebecca. It's fruit of the Spirit of God. It is, right out of uh, Galatians 5.22. Glenn, did you raise your hand? I did. Uh, joy is overcoming the circumstances that we have in our life because our hope is in Christ. And Christ has conquered, conquered, has conquered him. So, uh, you know, a lot of times the world wants to be happy. Matter of fact, the Bible says to 
to the revival that's happening all the time. But you can't have the door of the Lord. That, that's just that peace, that comfort, that love that only comes from Christ and trust and trusting in Him no matter what is happening in your life. Joy is passed on that. Oh, thank you for that. Um, joy, in part, there is a confidence that comes from the Lord that creates a joy in our spirit. A confidence that comes from the relationship that you have with the Lord. How's your relationship right this morning? Is it good? Is it as strong with God as you want it to be? Is it strong with God as it could be? The strength of your relationship is going to give you confidence in this crazy world. Talk about this crazy world. There is so much that can come to us on, on, a, on a single day. It's not, it's not an incredible. Without the confidence of knowing that we are kept in God's hand, there's not going to be joy. At least in part. You know, personally, and I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable. Is that the word I'm supposed to use? I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable. Not too vulnerable because I'm not about Warren Howard. I think that I've got it worked out as far as temptations. You know, I'm old and a lot of my temptations are gone. But golly, Satan will come and hit me with something I never even imagined before. This last week, I had stuff. Nah, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it was, but it was crazy. <laughs> Satan will get you. He knows which buttons to push. And if he can't get those buttons, he'll figure out another button. He is incredibly wily. And, and if you look at what he did to Eve. That son of a gun was so slick, it's just not funny. And then Adam, no more sense than to stand right there and let it happen. How does he do that? Satan will get you. The temptation will come. You've got to be careful. You have to have, you've got to be prayed up. You've got to have that strong relationship with the Lord, having that confidence to get through because the tough times, the temptations, new kind of temptations, as we season in life, excuse me, we'll go through a particular set of temptations appropriate to that season of life. Now, that's not the best way to say it, but you get what I'm meaning. When you're young, you got one set of temptations. When you're middle aged, you got another set of temptations. When you're a woman, you got a set of temptations. When you're a guy, You've got a set of temptations. And as you get older, you say, I don't have any more temptations. Well, that ain't true. Yeah, you do. There are all kinds of temptations. So, how do we get through them? The joy of the Lord is going to help us. And the joy of the Lord comes from, at least in part, a confidence in the Lord. Those things that y'all talked about. But here's the thing. We belong to him. He's going to carry us through every season of life. Whatever may come. Now let's go back to and Roy, yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Said, yes, ma'am. That's right. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Exactly right. Also, the Lord wanted y'all to hear that this morning. Go ahead, yeah. Also, in that scripture is a very favorite of mine because it says there was a joy that was set before him who endured. A lot of times we are looking for the joy in this life. We have to understand that the joy that's set before us, sometimes we're not going to feel all that joyful here. Sometimes we have to recognize that there's a joy set before us. Now, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we can put on the spirit of praise, we can put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and bring that joy in. But we also have to understand, and this is the hardest thing to understand, is the earth is temporary. We live, most of us live. In the temple, we have to also remember to live in the eternal. That brings a lot of strength when we realize that eternally, all the tears will be washed away, all the struggles will be gone, all the sin will be gone. So I think that's part of it is understanding that the scripture talks so much about we can't understand what joy God has in store for us. So we have to we have to temper the temporal with the eternal to get the reality of where we really are. Okay. 
You lost me on that last part. Okay, that's okay. I'm sure everybody else understands. Temperate. Okay. We're, we're living in the, in, the, in the earth. That's okay. I'll talk to you. I need to hurry up because we got time. But thank you for sharing that with us. So go back to first one, uh, uh, verse one. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. Encouragement here in this verse is from the Greek word that means to come alongside, help, counsel, exhort, which is what our Lord does to us. He comes beside us. When the scripture talks about encouraging from the Lord, that's what it, what it means. And that's what's happening. So if you look further, uh, the Greek word translated comfort portrays the Lord coming close and whispering words of gentle cheer Amen. or tender counsel in a believer's ear. That scripture, that one verse is incredibly rich in the kind of relationship that you can have with our Lord. Okay, if you're not experiencing this, you're missing out. So work to build your relationship. Participation, as it talks about in verse one, can also be translated as fellowship of the spirit. So how's your fellowship with the Lord, with your brothers and your sister this morning? It's a partnership. It's a, a commonality in knowing that we have the eternal life. Some people right now in this world are scared to death. They don't want to come out of their house. I hope you're not that way. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not making light of this plague that we got but for some folks, it has just absolutely overtaken their ability to enjoy life. And that's a shame. Because in God, in our relationship with the Lord, in our fellowship with him, we don't have to have that kind of fear. Let me share something with you this morning. Actually, I heard it. We heard it on the sermon coming in here this morning. This crazy fear that has captured our entire nation, it's captured the entire world. What do the bad guys want to do? And I'm not talking politics here, so don't take it that way. What do the bad guys want to do? If they can control you because you are afraid, then they'll lead you down every kind of road that you want to go. They will lead you to idols, to idol worship. Now, and I'm not talking about it's going to be so blank that it's, okay, go worship with an astronaut pole. But there, this world is incredibly excellent at creating idols for us, and we get wrapped up in that. And our fear is going to be a vehicle for that to happen. Do not put the relationship that you have with the Lord aside to the point that you are overcome by fear. Don't do it. You're a Christian. You belong to the Lord. He's got you in your hand, his hands. We talked about that, and I don't want to belabor the point. But here's the thing. We don't have to fear. I mean, beyond a normal fear that we all have that keeps us from doing stupid stuff, but beyond that, we do not have to fear. We don't have to live our lives in fear. You know, the first time I jumped out of an airplane, I was scared, but I was more scared of what my buddies were going to think if I didn't jump out that time. <laughs> no, we have crazy fears, don't we? That's all I mean about that. In the Lord, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear death. You tell me, explain to me right now, whoever wants to make a shot at it, why I should fear death. Look, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't fear death. You're a Christian sitting there. If you are, you should not fear death. Be better. It's the method of death that fears. Okay. I'll tell you what, me personally, I'm not even afraid of that. And that's not bravado. That is simply, I trust, in the, and I, I'm not suggesting you don't. I trust the Lord. I know he's going to bring me to that point, and he's going to take me beyond it and keep me in his hands all the time. What does the scripture say time and again? The angel is going to usher you into the presence of the Lord. So I'm not afraid of that time. Maybe I ought to be, but I'm not. And again, it's not bravado. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just think back on what she said. Um, yeah, you would think that the, 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 the method. Let me tell you from experience, God gives you a supernatural peace when you are standing there at death's door. And I think back on those times, and that was the sweetest time I have ever had with the Lord. And I laid there at death's door. Voltaire, when he died, the people who were there, he was a 
I believe he was a French philosopher. He was an atheist, and he was a rabid atheist. They said it was a terrible experience just to be in the room with that man, with that man as he was dying. I bet each of you have heard stories about people who died and they were not in the Lord. I've had, as you have, I'm sure, the experience to be around some folks who died in the Lord, and it was a peaceful going. Mm -hmm. Heard a story the other day about a lady who passed. Her daughter happened to be there. The uh, hospice nurse was there. It was like 11 or 12 minutes. And um, the lady who had passed, the nurse was in the room. She raised back up and let out an incredible scream. And then she laid back down and she was gone. Now, I don't know. What do you think? I just provide that for your consideration. What I believe is, is what you just said. God's going to work us through all that. I'm not sure how we got off on that. <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit, he guides these things. He sure does. So let's look at what Scripture says. What Scripture say about what we were just talking about? We were talking about encouragement, um, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, affection and sympathy. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? First Corinthians. First Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, we are all baptized in one body. Jews are great, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. This is in relation to fellowship with the spirit. And then um, going on, Paul, he in that particular scripture, he uses a literary device, these if clauses. He's essentially saying, though, uh, rhetorically, since there are these things, uh, since they, they, there are common shared experiences of Christians uh, who are united with Christ, sense. So what was his purpose? His purpose was to encourage that church. Who cares? You know, we do. We care about this scripture because it's the same today, right here, right now, in this class, in this church, in our particular lives. We should care. Now, I'm not beating you up. I know you all do care. You wouldn't be sitting here. We should be encouraged. Now, here's the thing. Encouraging is good. But we need to encourage as well. You need encouraging. Every one of you, God bless you, at some time needs encouraging. Because we all got that human condition going on and tough times coming at us. We need to encourage. We need to be encouraged. So encourage your brother and your sister. And I will ask you the question, how are you doing about that this morning? Are you an encourager? As Christians, we should all be. I'm smiling at you because that's a good thing, being encouraged. You go alongside your brother sometime, your sister sometime, and they're going through a tough time, and you encourage them, and it's going to be such a blessing to them. I can't tell you. Y'all guys, some of y'all come up to me afterwards, and you tell me you, you're happy with the lesson or whatever it is you say to me. I cannot tell you, and I'm not trying to get y'all to do that. I'm just saying. Good job, boy. <laughs> I'm just saying it's an encouragement. It is an encouragement. It is indeed. Because, you know, we all just need that sometimes. You need to encourage your brother. But I have little time, so I'm going to go quickly here this morning. Now, Hebrews 10.24, if you don't want to take my word for it, here's what Scripture says. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And it goes on. So, we better be making hay about encouraging folks. Ephesians 4.29 says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs. They used to, when they talk about doing that, talk about edifying, edifying one another, edification. I didn't know what that word meant for about 30 or 40 years. I looked it up one day and I was really amazed at what it means. It's a good thing. Be an encourager. Edify. Be an edification to your brother or your sister. I'm not sure that's a correct use of it. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. We may be comforted in the Lord, and we need to comfort our brothers and our sisters. Are you a comforter? So we should diligently submit ourselves that the Holy Spirit works in and through us. Do you submit to God? Of course, y'all say yes, we do. I understand. To your brother, you submit to your brother. And now you're asking, what's he talking about? 
submit to my brother. Scriptural. You believe me? It's not an easy thing to do. You say, wait a minute, boy. I won't be submitting to my brother. So submitting to one another. Ephesians 5, 20, 21, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You were talking about encouragement. Now you're talking about submitting. What's going on? Scripture tells us we need to be doing that. You do that in order to have a good relationship with your brother. You do that in order to have a great relationship with God. Submission is important. It's foundational to all relationships. Scripture says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female. In the fear of God, we submit to him and we should submit to our brothers. Now, don't misunderstand that word submit. It's simply considering others better than yourself. And you know that's what the scripture says. And I'm all out of town, time, so we got to go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day, for the blessings of it, for your people. Thank you that you brought them here this morning safely. Please, Lord God, protect them, protect their families, their extended families, their children, their grandchildren. Have mercy on them, Father. Don't let this plague come any further our tent. We pray, Lord, keep us safe. For those who are sick, we pray, heal them. For those that you have healed, Father, thank you. Thank you that we can cry out to you and you've heard our prayer and you've answered. Thank you, Father, that when we cry out to you, we can expect that you hear our prayer and you will answer. What a great and a good God you are. There is none like you in the universe. So, Father, we just lift up your name and say it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.